So now on to today's webinar, again, entitled Risk Factors and Impact of Chronic Cough. Uh, this web webinar is being presented by Dr. Imran Satya. Uh, Dr. Satya graduated uh, in medicine from the University of Cambridge in 2006. He gained his membership in the Royal College of Physicians and completed his specialist training in general internal medicine and respiratory medicine. In 2017, he was awarded a PhD in the Mechanisms of Cough, as well as the British Medical Association James Trust Award and the European Respiratory Society Respire 3 Marie Curie Postdoctoral Fellowship. Dr. Satya is now on faculty at McMaster and the Firestone Institute for Respiratory Health, working as an assistant professor in respiratory medicine. He consults on patients with asthma, refractory chronic cough, and complex airway diseases, and had a, has a broad research interest in understanding the mechanisms and developing treatments for these troublesome conditions. And so now I will pass it on to Dr. Satya. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you very much for the uh, um, invite, and thank you all for attending. So my name is Dr. Imran Satya, uh, and I'm a respiratory physician based here at McMaster. And I'm going to talk to you today about um, risk factors and impact associated with chronic cough. And the reason why I'm interested in chronic cough is um, because chronic cough is one of the most common symptoms that patients present to, to their family physician, but also one of the commonest reasons for referral uh, to a specialist in the hospital. Uh, and we really don't know much about this condition. So I thought uh, uh, I'd spend some of my time studying this condition and trying to develop um, a better understanding. So um, I hope you can all see my screen. These are my uh, disclosures. So the main three parts of this talk that I want to talk about is firstly, to give you all a bit of a primer on chronic cough uh, from a clinical perspective, what it is, what, why does it happen? How does it affect people? And how do we investigate and currently treat? So hopefully maybe 10, 15 minutes on that, then talk about some of the risk factors and then something about the outcomes of chronic cough from a population-based study. So firstly, what is chronic cough? So chronic cough, firstly, is not a new disease. I was able to find, this is almost uh, 200 years ago by uh, René Lenec. So he has a famous, he's a famous French physician who has a textbook called the Treatise on the Disease of the Chest. And in his textbook, he mentions that, um, and he used the word, a catar. He used the word acute, acute mucus catar, chronic mucus catar, and also dry catar. And he says that he prefers the term catar to that of bronchitis. And what he also said is that chronic dry catar or chronic dry cough is most usually an idiopathic affection. Idiopathic here means that there's no real uh, underlying cause for it that they can identify in individuals who are otherwise in very good health. And interestingly also puts, and this is 200 years ago, that opium repeated in very small doses, I find very efficacious in relieving the symptom. And one of the things that you'll notice is that 200 years later, we're still unfortunately doing the same thing in clinical practice. Um, William Stokes was an Irish physician, uh, also uh, talked about chronic cough. He describes it as a chronic bronchitis and he describes it as in his own words, that when distressing pectoral symptoms exist, the morbid physical signs absent, or if present, yet revealing an amount of disease too slight to account for the symptoms, meaning that the, either the symptoms of chronic cough is disproportionate to you know, on any underlying disease, or there is no underlying disease. And he says we may make the diagnosis of sympathetic irritation. So he, 200 years ago, realized that there is potentially a neuronal involvement and he developed this five-step approach uh, to investigating and uh, treating this condition where he says that often this is often a dry uh, cough. Uh, it's often in the absence of pulmonary disease, such as infection like TB and emphysema, or is out of proportion. There's the absence of any laryngitis or organic disease. And often when you look into the pharynx, it looks absolutely fine. And importantly, they've treated for chest diseases, but unfortunately failed uh, to improve their coughing. So this is 200 years ago. Just to bring you back to the modern day, I just wanna give you two recent cases to give you a flavor of the types of patients that I see. 
Um, and I often see people who are what I call unexplained chronic cough, which is about 40%. So they, I investigate them and, and I can't find an underlying uh, disease to treat or it's refractory where there is an underlying disease, but despite treatment of that underlying disease, they're still coughing a lot. So this is a 59 year old lecturer who has a two year history of daily cough, mainly a dry irritating sensation in her throat, which is easily triggered by strong smells, perfumes and talking. And her cough is so severe that it can cause chest pain and urinary incontinence. And because the cough, once it starts, she can't stop. She's had to either cancel or stop lectures completely. And the cough is so bad that her husband has to sleep in a different room. And she's tried all of the treatments, but unfortunately, none of them have improved. Uh, and frustrated because, you know, she's worried and frustrated and causing significant anxiety because it's, you know, it's uh, impacting her quality of life and activities of daily living. And as I've mentioned, all the investigations are normal. On the other side, we have somebody who is a 65 year old male who's a retired accountant who's had worsening cough over the last five years with occasional wheeze after severe bouts of coughing. He describes it as dry, but sometimes a feeling of something stuck in the throat with a severe persistent urge to cough. It's often triggered by changes in temperature, lying down or after meals, particularly biscuits and toast and cereal, dry foods. And he's recently put on some weight and the family physician has tried a antacid therapy called a PPI, but that doesn't help. He was, as a child, diagnosed with allergic asthma, but he's always been well controlled on low doses of inhaled steroids and bronchodilators. And the cough isn't seasonal. And the family physician has tried higher doses of steroids and another medication called a leukotriene receptor antagonist, but unfortunately that didn't help. He's a hypertensive, so he was on Ramipril, which is often one of the drugs that causes chronic cough, but the family physician changed this to Candisartan, uh, another type of blood pressure pill, and unfortunately the cough is still persistent. He's really concerned because this is affecting his retirement and social life, and occasionally he felt that he was going to lose consciousness because of the severe bouts of coughing. So this is just a flavor of two of the types of patients that I see in my clinic on a regular basis. One of the things that you'll notice is that patients with this condition often have uh, sensations in the throat and the chest, and they're very easily triggered by low levels of chemical, mechanical, or thermal stimulation, which in otherwise normal people, that isn't the case. So cough can be classified into acute, subacute, and chronic. Acute is generally lasting one to three weeks, and this is most commonly due to viruses, upper respiratory tract infections, bronchitis, and pneumonia. But then there's a period of six, three to eight weeks when the cough can linger, uh, post-infectious. And then when it's more than eight weeks, this is the current definition that we use to diagnose chronic cough, that the cough has been going on for more than eight weeks. Uh, and often these are associated with asthma, nasal disease, and reflux disease. And I'll explain to you why that might be the case in a few slides. So this is a, a significant problem. So this is data from the US going back 2010, showing that um, for ambulatory care visits, cough um, is the commonest symptom why people attend uh, to go and see a doctor. And if you look at over-the-counter medicine sales, this is just taken yesterday from this website, uh, which was uh, uh, on the Statistica web website, that this is in billions of dollars. And these are uh, uh, the cost per year from 2016 and projected for 2027. The gray bars is in the USA. The blue bars in Canada, about half a billion US dollars, and United Kingdom also similar levels. Um, and worryingly, the, the trend is going up significantly in the US. Some people will say that this uh, is also possibly due to people taking uh, cough syrups for drug abuse. And there is an issue about dextromethorphan being overused in particularly the younger uh, individuals uh, as an as a alternative to, to getting a high. And this is a significant concern. Uh, particularly in the States. In Canada, it looks like the numbers are relatively stable, although there's a bit of a trend going up uh, in recent years. So the other important thing is that often people think that chronic cough is a relatively benign condition and there's nothing major to worry about. So this is just to explain to you how often people cough in a 24-hour period. So we can wear a cough monitor, which will allow us to calculate and measure in a 24-hour period when are they coughing and how often are they coughing. So these are some common respiratory diseases, asthma, COPD, interstitial lung disease, and these are chronic coughers. And just to compare, these are people who have a viral infection 
uh, like RSV or influenza or even COVID. And we on the y-axis, you can see 24 hour cough frequency. And you can see this is in the uh, a log to the base 10. And you can see that um, um, controls, so all, all people who don't have chronic cough or any lung disease on average, they cough about half a cough per hour. So 12 coughs per day on average, but there's a bit of variability around that. And as you're getting more and more um, uh, towards chronic cough, the median cough frequency for chronic cough patients is about 20 coughs per hour. So in a day, you're looking at five, 600 coughs per hour, per day. And people have been coughing often for 10 to 11 years on average in my clinic. So you can see how much that could be impacting them. And it's a bit like, imagine you have a viral infection, you cough 20 times an hour, but imagine having that for your whole life. Um, so that's an important uh, feature that frequency is a major problem. But also people get really troubled by the sensations associated with the coughing. And these are the common sensations that people describe. So they often describe it as an irritation, a tickle, an unpleasant sensation, or an itch. And they can be predominantly located in the neck and the throat, sometimes in the sternum and chest, and, and very rarely in the abdomen. And as I mentioned, these patients often start coughing to very low levels of mechanical, chemical, and thermal stimulation. And when I ask them in clinic, they can get triggered to their coughing by things like smoke, dry perfumes, smells, uh, cold air, uh, talking, laughing, singing, uh, during meals or after meals, and also things like lying down and stress can, can make the coughing worse. Um, so these are some of the triggers and sensations that people with chronic cough describe. And because they have such high cough frequencies, five, 600 times a day, and because they have such strong sensations and it's impacting their daily activities of living quality of life, it can have significant impact on physical, psychological, and social um, well-being. So physically, it can cause urinary incontinence. It can cause syncope, sleep disturbance, exhaustion, chest pain, and vomiting. Socially, it can be uh, lead to absenteeism. It can affect their, their spousal and family relationships, social gatherings, medical consultations, treatment expense. And particularly now with COVID, most of my patients are scared to go out in public because as soon as they start coughing, people think they are infective and want to keep their distance away from them, particularly in public transport and, and shopping centers. And psychologically, it can be very frustrating, embarrassing. They get in depression, anxiety, and often feel very angry because this is, problem has not been adequately addressed. Um, this is some new data looking at um, what impact cough has on uh, their work ability. So if you look here on the x-axis on um, this left-hand side, you have people who have poor, moderate, good, and excellent work ability. And here it's divided into no chronic cough, non-productive and productive. And you can see that in the poor work ability score, there's almost a 15% of people have productive cough uh, and about five to 6% with poor. And in the excellent group, you the people who have a, non, a productive cough or a non-productive cough, they have are, are less likely, or, or the percentage of people in that group is is, is far less. And likewise, uh, people with productive and non-productive cough are more likely uh, to take time off work with sick leave. And in a multi uh, in a, in a multivariate analysis, adjusting for age, sex, smoking, this group did a calculated sick leave. Uh, the odds of taking sick leave based on males and females and whether you have productive or non-productive cough. And you can see here that the risk is about 50% greater and the ability to have excellent workability is approximately uh, 30 to 30, uh, 30 to 40% uh, lower as well. So this clearly demonstrates that it's having a significant impact on their work as well. And if you look at some of the US data, one of the things that you'll notice here is that uh, people have been coughing for many, many years. And I just want to highlight that the average duration of chronic cough uh, is similar to my clinic. It's about seven to eight years. In the US, it's in, in females, it was nine years. And in males, it was 7.7 .7 years. Um, and importantly, they've seen multiple specialists, have had a number of blood tests, uh, and, and uh, some of them have been hospitalized and often taken steroids as well. And if you look at some of the other uh, cough suppressions that they've taken, unfortunately, 60% uh, are still taking narcotics, including codeine. So as I mentioned, uh, over 200 years since Rene Lenek described using opium and narcotics, you know, much hasn't unfortunately changed. 
and hopefully in the next couple of years we'll be developing new treatments for chronic cough which are non-narcotics um, but unfortunately at the moment we're still using low dose um, narcotics as one treatment option so what do you need to know about the, some of the basic neurophysiology of chronic cough i'll spend five ten minutes on this firstly it's important you understand that cough is both voluntary and involuntary uh, because each of all of us can voluntarily cough whenever we want to, but it can also happen involuntarily as a reflex. Um, so talking about the reflex, this is the basic wiring diagram that I show my residents and students. So here you have the, uh, the, the brain, the airways, um, and these uh, lines here demonstrate the afferent vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve has two types. One is the C fibers, which are chemically sensitive, and the other one is the A delta fibers, which is mechanically sensitive. And when something irritates that and stimulates that nerve ending, action potentials are generated and propagated to the nucleus tractus solitarius in the brainstem here. And then the second neuron goes to the thalamus and the third neuron goes to the primary somatosensory cortex. And every single one of us at some point in our life has experienced this uh, as a throat irritation, and often, if this is great enough, it can cause an urge to cough. And finally, if that stimulus is great enough, it will cause coughing. And we think that in chronic cough, there's a problem with this wiring in that this pathway has become hypersensitive or hyper-responsive. And we're not completely sure uh, which part it is that is the problem, but we think it could be a combination as well. And because of this, uh, we often consider condi conditions like asthma, where you have a lot of mucus, inflammation, particularly eosinophilic or even neutrophilic. These are all capable of sensitizing these airway nerves. But you also have to remember that the vagus nerve has afferents, which uh, are send signals from the, from the esophagus. So things like acidity can also sensitize these nerve endings. And also the nose has a trigeminal nerve, which also goes back vagus nerve in, in the in the brainstem and therefore anything which is wrong with your nose particularly eosinophilic inflammation or allergic rhinitis this condition can also sensitize these airway nerves and make you want to cough so this is one of the reasons why we often try to understand where and treat for asthma reflux disease and nasal disease uh, to try and control the coughing cough and therefore uh, cough can be because of increased stimulation it can be because of acidity and because of, of inflammation in the nose but also maybe that the nerve itself is also hyper excitable or also recently there's evidence to suggest that the brain itself has evidence of central sensitization or something slightly different called impaired inhibitory controls. This idea that the inhibitory pathways which are tonically active have stopped working and therefore signals which otherwise wouldn't make you cough are now making you cough. Uh, stimuli include things like mucus, eosinophils, bronchial constriction, reflux, environmental occupational, which is now becoming very important, as I'll come to in a second. Um, and in terms of uh, central treatments, we often give people, uh, as I mentioned, morphine, but also some studies showing evidence for pregabalin, gabapentin, and amitriptyline, and also now speech therapy as a treatment option for cough suppression. Uh, as well. So just to give you a bit of a background and just one slide on some uh, nerve uh, channels uh, found on C fibers. As I've mentioned before, the nerve endings of C fibers are chemically sensitive and they, they, they express these trip channels called trip V1, which is sensitive to chili pepper extract. So when you're eating uh, really spicy food, it activates trip V1 on your taste buds and that, that's what gives you the heat sensation. Uh, so it's res res responsive to chili pepper extract, but also uh, we have trip A1, which is sensitive to, to acrolein in smoke, but also aldehydes in perfumes and aerosols. And now you can kind of get to see why patients often start coughing to exposure to, to these at low levels, um, because these are also temperature sensitive. And maybe that's the reason why people respond uh, to cough by changes in temperature, particularly hot and cold air. Uh, and also this ATP, which we'll come to, uh, which has become a new area of interest because now we have drug therapy, which is blocking P2X3, um, which is causing significant reduction in chronic cough, which is great news. And we also have things like inflammatory, like prostaglandins and bradykinins, which also bind to these receptors, making you want to cough. The A-delta fibers 
um, are also um, acid sensing ion channels. So they respond to things like hydrogen ions and uh, uh, um, uh, acidity from reflux. But also we have mechanosensors uh, which are sensitive to things like mucus. So these are all potential triggers to coughing uh, and it works via very, very precise ion channels. And therefore treating these potentially with newer ion channel antagonists might be a treatment option. So what do we do for patients in clinic? So we recently wrote a guideline and in that guideline, these were the four fundamental principles. We want to investigate patients to rule out serious underlying lung disease or heart disease, to diagnose, to prevent over and under diagnosis, treat based on specific disease and traits, and also then monitor to ensure effectiveness and reduce side effects and titrate treatment. So this is uh, a stepwise approach. Um, this is published recently uh, in the Canadian Journal of Respiratory Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. And in step one in primary care, we're advising and recommending to check, test and refer. So check the cough history, check if they're on ACE inhibitor, stop smoking, do a basic spirometry with reversibility, a chest x-ray and a CBC. And if there's signs and symptoms of coughing up blood, weight loss, fevers or an abnormal chest x-ray, then they should be referred urgently um, under the hopefully within and be seen within two weeks. And depending on your first investigations and clinical acumen, if you think they have asthma, COPD, chronic rhinosinusitis or reflux disease, then they should be treated according uh, to those pathways. If they're smoking, to stop smoking. And as I have mentioned before, if there's an ACE inhibitor, then they should be switched. If, however, the cough persists, then in secondary care, my job is to confirm and check the diagnoses of asthma, eosinophilic bronchitis, reflux disease, esophageal dysmotility, uh, rhinosinusitis, uh, and inducible laryngeal obstruction and muscle tension dysphonia. And these are some of the tests that we can do. I also do some basic cough severity scores uh, using either a zero to 10 numerical scale or just a, a visual analog scale. And there are some quality of life tools that we can also do. And then I only treat based on finding an underlying uh, uh, disease. If after treating that or, or, or not finding anything, then we are in the position where we can say, well, is this cough truly refractory to, to, to these conditions or is it completely unexplained? And now my options are either to do uh, some speech therapy and cough uh, control therapies. This includes um, education, cough suppression exercises, cough avoidance strategies, and reducing laryngeal irritation and some counseling. Or the other option, which you can do either alone or in combination, is to give people centrally acting neuromodulators, such as pregabalin, gabapentin, low-dose morphine for a two-week trial, and amitriptyline. The evidence for this isn't great. There are small studies. Many of them are have unvalidated endpoints, um, uh, but these are the best that we currently have from the guidelines. And then based on these trials of treatment, we then assess benefit, usually on our second uh, clinic follow-up. And if there is benefit, we monitor side effects, particularly for some of these drugs, because they can cause nausea, sedation, drowsiness, and unsteadiness. And we try to get them down to the lowest dose possible to help. If they don't help at all, then we try something else, or we recruit them into clinical trials. So this is the kind of overall uh, uh, pathway that we use uh, in our clinical practice. So I think I'm halfway through. Uh, and the last 20 minutes, I hopefully want to just go through some of the epidemiology um, of chronic cough uh, that um, you might be interested in as well. So um, about uh, six or seven years ago, one of my colleagues did a systematic review and meta-analysis of the prevalence of chronic cough globally. And what they demonstrated was, on average, the, the prevalence across the whole world is almost 10%. But what you'll notice is that there are some countries which are really red, like Australia, where the prevalence is 18%. In Europe, it's 13%. In America, it's about 11%. And in other countries like Asia and Africa, where you might suspect chronic cough to be more of a problem, particularly with HIV, TB, AIDS, um, and uh, pollution in China, and these kind of things, you know, it's really quite low. And we don't understand why it's so variable and various, uh, you know, people have speculated it could be because the definition that they've used is the old chronic bronchitis definition, which has been around for a long time, since the 1950s and 60s, which uh, Charles Fletcher developed, 
which is chronic cough, which is productive of sputum on most days for at least uh, three months in a year for two consecutive years. So one explanation is that, you know, they've used the wrong definition. The other explanation is that, okay, maybe that we just don't have enough studies from those countries. But then more recently, um, when they've looked at studies which have used the eight-week definition, and you'll still see that within the European continent, it's 12% in UK, 7% in Finland, Germany 5%, Copenhagen in 4%. In and even in South Korea, Japan, and Nigeria, you're looking at one to two, three percent. So it's even with the eight week definition, there's still high variability. And even within the European continent, which is very closely associated, obviously, especially in location wise, that there's still a significant variability. So this is been going on and some uncertainty of why such variability exists. So we wanted to, and at the time notice seven years ago, we had no data on Canada because uh, there was no data collected. So when I came to Canada in 2018, I went to speak to Parminder and I said, look, I'd like to study chronic cough in the CLSA. And he, uh, we put a proposal through and we studied chronic cough. I did want to point out here that um, this is, as you know, uh, for patients recruited from the age of 45 onwards, it's, it's not 18 plus, it's 45 onwards. And the question that was asked in the CLSA was, do you have a daily cough um, every day for the last 12 months? So it's a 12 month, not the eight week definition, but at least it includes everybody by definition who's more than eight weeks. So based on this, the prevalence in the CLSA of the 30,000 participants at baseline was 16%. So I was quite surprised by this because this is like the second highest in, in, in the world after Australia. But a lot of these coughs are obviously, as you can see, driven by people who have, are current smokers. But even if you look at non-smokers, you're still, you know, around 10%. So it's still quite high, uh, even in non-smokers. And you'll notice that it increases with aging. Uh, and, and one important thing here, which I want to point out, is that it, it seemed to be slightly more common in males and females, um, which is slightly different to what we see in, in clinic. The other important thing we noticed was that prevalence was lowest in Quebec, around 10%, and in highest in Ontario, around 16%. And the incidence, because we have longitudinal data from follow-up one, was also lowest in Quebec at 8% and highest in Ontario at 12%. So at um, for the baseline chronic cough, we also looked at variables which may increase or reduce the risk of chronic cough. And you can see here that having a lower airflow uh, or worse airflow obstruction, uh, lower FEV1, the presence of other symptoms, and particularly asthma and COPD significantly increases um, the prevalence of chronic cough at baseline. But I don't think that's the interesting thing. For me, the interesting thing is that if you have no airflow obstruction, normal lung function, no other symptoms, no asthma, no COPD, the prevalence is still 11 to 12%, still very high. And likewise, the incidence pattern is very similar. Um, we don't have any other uh, incidents globally to compare with. The only study that I'm aware of is the Rotterdam study, which looked at the incidence of chronic cough in Rotterdam, and that was around 1.5 per 100 person years. So, you know, this is almost three times higher, uh, which is quite high. Um, so it's important to understand that um, the chronic cough question is a dichotomous variable. It doesn't ask about frequency. We don't ask about severity, and we don't really significantly have any cough specific quality of life questionnaires. So that's an important limitation. Secondly, that it's self-reported, it's an older population above 40 uh, or 45, and it's from the general community. And these are not people recruited from specialist centers. It's predominantly white and from an urban population because from the data collection site, they had to be within 25 to 50 kilometers. And my biggest question here is, if the prevalence is really one in 10 in the general community, you know, I, I would have expected more people in clinic. Um, and, you know, all of us know people, uh, but, you know, maybe uh, people with chronic cough, they're trying to suppress their cough. So this one in 10 or 10% chronic cough in the general community is still, I'm not sure whether this is an overestimate, but it's, you know, I'm still trying to fully understand this and, and be critical of my own data. So because of the issues related to Quebec and Ontario and the differences, uh, we stratified the analysis based on whether you're English speaking or French speaking. And I will point out here 
is that we did this based on which uh, language the participant uh, completed the questionnaire in. And we assumed that if they compute, completed it in French, that that was their predominant or dominant language, and likewise for English. So if you look at the English speaking uh, participants, uh, no surprises that cough increases with age. I've mentioned before that it's more common in males and slightly greater risk for developing chronic cough in males, in smokers, um, in being overweight and obese. But when you look at the location issues, if you're English speaking, living in Ontario, compared to somebody who's living in Quebec, it's almost 41% lower risk. And then Nova Scotia, uh, 33% and 20% and Newfoundland. So as you're moving east, something is going on here. And also out in the west and, and potentially in the north, um, there are, it's numerically lower, but not statistically significant, except for in British Columbia, it's about 13% lower. But Ontario seems to be the highest. So it suggests that location, even if you're English speaking, seems to be uh, uh, an important risk uh, modifier. But if you're French speaking and you compare with French speaking in Ontario versus French speaking in Quebec, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, so, uh, all, and, and as you know, many of you know will know that most of the uh, people were, were, who had the questionnaire done in French were either living in Ontario or Quebec. We don't have anything from the other uh, provinces. So it suggests that both language and location both matter. And I don't fully understand why people have suggested it could be because of climate, could be because of pollution. Uh, it could also be because of their social understanding. Because when somebody's reading the question that do you have a chronic cough every day for the last 12 months, some people might interpret that as do I have a troublesome cough? Do I have a cough which is troubling enough for me to go see a doctor? Um, so, you know, some people think it's only a cough. You know, it's fine. It's not a major issue. Um, or maybe that some people, you know, don't, you know, ha have underreported. Uh, there may be a response bias. So I don't fully understand, uh, in all honesty, the differences, but this is something which we're looking into now uh, further as well. So one of the things that I wanted to explain was in the population level, we're seeing more males and females saying they have chronic cough. But when you look at the clinic, this is what I see, and this has been replicated in most European and US uh, clinics, in that it peaks in the 50s and 60s, and it's almost twice as more common in females and males. And this is what we all see also in the clinical trials. So although we're seeing male predominance in the population, we're actually seeing female predominance in the clinics. And that could be because is that people with chronic cough, it's affecting the females more. They have higher frequencies and higher severities. And there is some data to support that. That could be one explanation. The other explanation could be that for men, it's not as bothersome. So they don't go see a doctor and, and they can't, you know, they're, they're a bit more stoic about it. That's the other possibility. There's also age and sex differences. So if you look at in China, um, you'll notice that the peak here is around 30 to 40 compared to 50s and 60s in Western countries. Uh, and again, you'll notice in China though, and this is in cough clinics, it's more male dominant, not female dominant. And, and some of my Chinese colleagues and collaborators have mentioned that um, it's there's some social stigma associated with uh, coughing, particularly in females. And often, you know, uh, it's not seen as a nice thing. So there's a lot of uh, less people that they're seeing in clinic uh, who are female, possibly because of that. And even if you divide that by underlying disease like cough variant, asthma, eosinophilic bronchitis, reflux, atopic cough, you know, it doesn't seem to be female predominant in China. In Korea, also, we're seeing chronic cough is more common in males. And when you do a multivariate analysis in chronic cough, again, female sex doesn't seem to have a significant um, association uh, with developing chronic cough. So in the Far East, we're not seeing the same patterns. Um, and I just wanted to point that out. So in this, going back to the CLSA, we've looked at what are the other associate comorbidities which might impact uh, the incidence. So this is age, sex, and smoking adjusted. And you'll notice here that there are a number of uh, cardiovascular conditions like heart attacks, hypertension, congestive heart failure, and pneumonia and influenza, which you might expect to increase your risk of developing chronic cough. I will point out here that in these conditions, all of these conditions, people would have been prescribed an ACE inhib inhibitor. And at the time when we were doing this analysis, almost three years ago, two, three years ago, we didn't have the ACE inhibitor data available. 
Um, so, so we don't know whether or not this is being driven by being on uh, perindropyl or ramipro. But interestingly, we also noticed that some, some other conditions like pain, mood disorders, anxiety, and depression are just as important in developing chronic cough. And as I mentioned you, that wiring diagram, one of the things that we're really noticing in, in, in the mechanistic studies is that these the mental health disorders, pain, mood, anxiety, are really impacting those neurons in making people cough. So we wanted to look into this into more detail because we, we see people in chronic cough cl clinic who are anxious and depressed, but we, we don't know whether this is cause or an effect. So we, we, we looked at this in a multivariate analysis where looked at the risk of developing chronic cough based on having higher depressive symptom scores based on the high CESD10 or the psychological distress K10 more than 22, but we also added in personality traits as, as in, in, the very, in the multivariate analysis. And what you'll notice here that having psychological distress and depressive symptoms at baseline, when you have no chronic cough, these are baseline scores, increases your risk of developing chronic cough by about 20 to 22%. And that's independent of age, sex, smoking, asthma, COPD, all the other bad stuff. And likewise for personality traits, uh, there doesn't seem to be any statistical significance, although one can argue that having low conscientious scores, uh, there's a bit of a trend uh, to it being almost significant in, 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 in leading to chronic cough three years down the road. But one of the other interesting things that we know is that what about chronic cough? What, what, how does that affect anxiety and depression? So here we turn the model around and we put in chronic cough at baseline, incident, and persistent in the as an exposure. And we adjusted for psychological distress and personality traits, and whether or not they had higher incidence of depressive symptoms three years later. And you can see here clearly that, again, chronic cough also causes or leads to higher depressive symptoms. And the same pattern we see also for psychological distress, that chronic cough increases your risk of higher symptoms of psychological distress. So what it kind of suggests is that there's a bit of a three-way relationship that depressive symptoms, distress, and chronic cough, incident chronic cough, they're all interrelated. And some of these personality traits don't directly impact chronic cough, but may do so via impacting depressive symptoms and psychological distress. And this kind of relationship has also been demonstrated with chronic pain now uh, in, the, in the Copenhagen study where people have noticed that increasing frequency of pain from non to daily, there's an increased prevalence of chronic cough in the Copenhagen study. And in their multivariate uh, analysis, what they noticed was that um, having chronic cough pain on a daily basis increases your odds of uh, developing chronic cough. And likewise, having chronic, sorry, uh, having chronic pain also increases your risk of developing uh, chronic cough. So it's again, an uh, interrelated uh, 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 condition where pain can increase your risk of chronic cough um, and, and, and the other way around as well. So um, finally, I just want to touch on mortality because we don't have much data on how chronic cough impacts mortality. We know that from the last 200 years, people who have productive chronic cough uh, with chronic bronchitis, they're associated with deaths due to TB, pneumonia, COPD. Um, but this is a multivariate model where we've adjusted for age, sex, smoking, BMI, and respiratory diseases. Uh, and independent of all these things, uh, productive cough increases your risk uh, by about 50%. Um, but importantly, dry chronic cough doesn't, which is, which is somewhat reassuring. Um, and this is currently under second round of review and should be hopefully published in the next couple of months. But th this is uh, new data, which we've just become available. So I want to end there and leave some time for discussion. But just to summarize that chronic cough is a cough which is going on for more than eight weeks. It can be refractory to underlying diseases or can be unexplained. We think it happens because of activation of neuronal pathways in the peripheral and central nervous system. It reduces quality of life, increases mortality, particularly with productive chronic cough. And we currently treat people by excluding serious causes and then reducing the cough with centrally acting neuromodulators. We can see that there are risk factors such as age, sex, smoking, 
respiratory cardiac disease, but now also anxiety and depression all impact uh, the development of chronic cough. And often, as I've mentioned and shown, they can be often interrelated. There seems to be a suggestion that the language, um, location, and culture matters in, in, in developing chronic cough and that there are important differences from what we see in the general community in epidemiological studies and what we see in specialty clinics. Um, and finally, from population level, it's important to mention that um, it, chronic cough um, increases mental health disorders and chronic pain. It, it reduces your ability to work and increases sick leave, but also increases mortality with productive uh, chronic cough, but not right chronic cough. So I'm going to end there. I would like to make out a big shout out to Alexander Mehi or Alex and Sohail who, and Parminda who have really been helping me to uh, analyze and get this data published. And uh, hopefully you'll see some more data uh, related to um, hopefully with the social participation activities of daily living, which we're currently working on. And then also looking at pollution um, and uh, climate differences as well. Um, and these are my collaborators in Canada in Manchester and also my funding bodies. So thank you all very much for uh, joining in. I think I've left uh, exactly 15 minutes uh, for any questions. I noticed that there's some in the chat. If there is anything, I'm happy to answer. Um, yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat quite yet, but sometimes they, sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Um, Great presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, maybe I'll just start with one question that, well, I'll, I'll pose two and we'll see where, where they go. Um, but one thing that I was, you know, oftentimes to um, think about next steps, but obviously there's lots of opportunity to explore the social phenomenon around this that you've uncovered, um, as well as the different neural pathways. Um, the links to mental health. I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, your your sort of next steps in terms of exploring those things, either with or without the the LSA data. Um, and then the other thing I I thought about is you know uh, COVID, right? Um, this is probably the first presentation I've heard in quite a while that hasn't somehow talked about COVID. Uh, but I imagine that there's there's a lot you need to tease out in terms of uh, chronic cough as a lingering factor in COVID. So just yeah. uh, two things maybe you can touch on and then we'll see if any more questions come. So I'll talk about the second question first. So uh, at the time when we started doing this uh, analysis, it was actually pre-COVID uh, before February, March, 2020. So uh, at the time uh, we, we didn't have much COVID data. I think the CLSA now has uh, COVID specific data and post COVID data. So um, that will be interesting to look at. From a clinical perspective, um, I think um, I'm seeing a lot more post-COVID chronic coughers, um, and some of the uh, published data suggests it can be as high as 20% of people who have had COVID develop a chronic cough. And what's really interesting is that people in the clinic are saying that when I had the COVID, I actually didn't cough. I just got fatigue, malaise, fever, sore throat. I didn't cough at all. And then the cough only started a week or two afterwards. Um, and then it kind of never went away. Uh, and so that's an interesting kind of phenomena, which I'm trying to understand that what is the neuronal mechanism behind that? Has the virus sensitized these airway nerves? And that's taken a bit of time for neuroplasticity to kick in. And then that's left them with this terrible cough, which then doesn't go away. Um, so that's that's some of my own clinical um, feelings. Um, with regards to the other question, the first question is about the mental health disorders and um, um, particularly with depressive symptoms and psychological distress. Um, one of the things which we need to look into more carefully is the medication data because it's available but at the time of doing the analysis, we didn't have it all cleaned up. Um, but it will be interesting to look at that does, if you have psychological distress and depressive symptoms, and then you were treated for that at baseline, then does at follow-up one, does your cough go away? And the reason why I say that is because one of the treatments 
that we use in clinical practice uh, sometimes are, uh, is amitriptyline to reduce coughing. And amitriptyline is a antidepressant. Um, and one of the things that I'm trying to understand uh, is trying to relate to what we see on an individual patient in clinic to see whether or not that signal can actually be detected and found at a population level. And can we work in both ways? So I, I, I do, you know, I see patients in clinic, I do mechanistic studies with basic science, I do a bit of epidemiology now, and I run clinical trials. And what I'm trying to understand is how does how can we understand what we see at the population level and experiment on an individual level? And how can we see, uh, you know, observe what we're seeing in uh, an individual level in clinic and then scale it up at a population level? So the antidepressant story is an interesting one because um, I'd really like to understand that more carefully um, and in more detail. Um, and um, so that's something which we should have been thinking about as well. Um, so there's, there's going to be no shortage of uh, of work to, to to dig ourselves into. Great. Um, we just had a request if you could put up, and there might be a follow up question once you do um, the slide on side effects. Um, yes. Or risk factors. I think it, I don't. Was it the side effects or risk factors? There's two different requests. Uh, might be one in the same. And then um, while you put that up, um, we have. Uh, a participant asked, and you can use your discretion how you answer this one. Uh, but my sister has had a chronic cough for yeah, I saw that. Yeah, years. Um, you know, would drug therapy be useful after all this time? So, yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, on a I have a cough clinic specifically for chronic cough every Tuesday afternoon uh, at McMaster and Friday mornings at St. Joe's, uh, the Firestone, and. Um, I routinely see people who have been coughing for 15, 20, 30 years. I also see some people who are coughing for five years, but on average, the median or median is about eight to 10 years. So mm -hmm. sure, you know, it sounds like your sister probably needs to come to my clinic to get assessed and treated. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, with regards to side effects, so there's some, uh, this is, I think this is the side effects of the treatments that we currently give, uh, the slide. So when we've excluded and ruled out everything else, and we really think that this is going to require some centrally acting neuromodulators, um, we give people these options, pregabalin, gabapentin, which as you know, or, or might know, is our anti-epileptics, but there's two randomized controlled trials for each showing that these may be effective. And the kind of side effects that people get are, are things like, uh, unsteadiness, sometimes uh, they can get dizziness, sometimes they can get a bit of weight loss or weight uh, or even hair loss I've seen um, with pregabalin. But one of the things that I do is we, we give people very, very low doses. So the typical dose of pregabalin for epilepsy is 150 milligrams twice a day. And for gabapentin, it can be as high as 600 three times a day. But I stop people off on 25 or 50 milligrams twice a day for pregabalin and then slowly increase to maybe 100 twice a day. And then for gabapentin, I start off at 100 three times a day and maybe go up to 300 three times a day and nothing more than that. For morphine, I actually, morphine is usually my first, first line therapy. And it can be quite scary when I say to people, oh, I want to give you an opioid for chronic cough. But in my experience, out of the four that I've listed there, it has probably has the best evidence. And I have the best experience with that. And it's usually just five milligrams twice a day, which is a very, very low dose. Uh, and at that dose, you know, the only side effect that people complain of usually is constipation. Um, and we that can be easily treated with laxatives or fruit and veg and just water. And I only give people a two week trial just to see how they're going. And if after two weeks it doesn't work, then you stop it because the evidence suggests that the effect is very, very quick. Um, so, so people often try that. Some people who don't want to take morphine sometimes try codeine or tramadol, but the evidence for that just doesn't exist. But some people do try that off-label use um, as well. So, so those are the kind of side effects that we have to monitor and, and, and observe for. Um, there's a, I think there's a question here about um, chronic cough in lung cancer. So yes, yeah, so there's a one of my colleagues, Amelie Harley, uh, 
uh, published a paper on uh, coffin lung cancer. And, and the frequency is actually uh, quite similar. It, it can range from about 15 coughs per hour to 20 coughs per hour, so it's still quite high, high cough frequency. And the other interesting study is that there's actually a randomized controlled trial looking at a prepitant, which is an anti-nausea drug, and there's evidence to suggest that that a prepitant reduces cough frequency as well. And the mechanism behind that is a prepitant is a neurokinin-1 antagonist. And these neurokinin-1 receptors are found in the brainstem. And if you block this receptor, you reduce nausea, but also it improves coughing. So there's a paper, one paper that I'm aware of looking at cough in lung cancer, which has improved cough frequency uh, in lung cancer. Uh, but it's very expensive, a prepotent. Uh, but maybe other other drugs will be coming out soon. Great. Um, can you actually, the slide that uh, Adeline had wanted was the one just before the end? This one? Uh, the summary um, or this one? I'm not Maybe. sure. Adeline, uh, you'll be more specific if you still want the want it. I think it might be this one actually. Okay. Um, yeah. it was about, so she may have a, a specific question. Um, let's see. And I, there was a question that wasn't posted in the Q and A, but I will uh, answer it um, or ask it. Um, sorry if I missed this. But does chronic cough on its own lead to physical damage, perhaps in the respiratory tract? Yeah. So what we do see is that it doesn't cause damage in the lungs itself per se. So having chronic cough doesn't impact you, your lung function or getting fibrosis or getting cancer. But what I can say is that it causes a lot of chest pains, rib fractures, intercostal muscle tears diaphragm pain, stomach pains. So it doesn't cause damage inside your lungs per se, but it can affect the chest wall a lot. Um, and they, that in itself can physical damage. A lot of women, 50% of women in my clinic who have chronic cough have urinary incontinence. I have one patient who has fecal incontinence and they walk around with pads. So you can see that it depends how you define physical damage, but you know, as I've explained, you know, it's um, it can cause significant problems. Um, some people have terrible headaches because of lots of coughing. Some people lose consciousness, particularly men. Uh, they get syncope or presyncope and feel as if they're going to lose consciousness. They've got a very you've got to be very careful when you're driving. And if you go into a bout of chronic cough, often patients they start coughing and then they can't stop coughing, and that can be a big problem as well. Great. Well, I don't see any more questions, and that's actually good timing. Um, again, thank you very much, Dr. Sata, uh, for your presentation, and thanks for everybody's participation and questions. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that the next deadline for our data access application is January 18th of 2023. You can visit our website under data access to review what data is available, as well as additional details about the application process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete your anonymous survey when you exit the Zoom session today. Uh, the next CLSA webinar uh, is entitled Examining the Bidirectional Association Between Adiposity and Cognitive Function Among Middle-Aged and Older Adults in the CLSA. It will be presented December 14th at noon by Dr. Mohammed Nazma Saqib and Dr. Peter Hall. Uh, registration details for the webinar will be posted on our website. Um, and also remember the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And we invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. Um, everyone have a wonderful afternoon and thank you again. Bye.